My name is Tim Sanders, and you are watching Voices of Authority, brought to you by Upwork. Today's guest is going to talk to us about what I consider one of the most important issues of our time, artificial intelligence. Kareem Lakhani is an esteemed professor at Harvard Business School. As a matter of fact, you can see some of his accolades here on the screen. We are so lucky to have him. He's also the founding director of innovation science at Harvard. And along with Marcos Ianciti, he is the co-author of one of my favorite books of 2020, Competing in the Age of AI. Welcome to the show, Kareem. Hey, Tim, great to be with you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Been looking forward to this conversation. Your book really cuts through all of the noise. When I look at this subject of artificial intelligence, I've got to say, there's just so much hype. There's just yeah. so much hand wringing. And I think the bigger issue, though, is you know we need to give people at every level of an organization a lens to truly see AI for what it is. Talk to us about that. Yeah, look, I think, you know, I'm, uh, I, either it's good news or bad news, I've studied, studied the two most hyped terms in business, innovation yeah. and also AI, yeah. uh, and no fault of my own, okay? Um, and uh, look, I think, uh, you know, the, I've been thinking about this with Marco, who's a you know, dear friend, co-author with me, about yeah. how, uh, the world of business, the world of organizations is is going through this sort of exogenous shock of these new technologies yeah. of AI and data analytics as transforming the, the guts of the organization. If you sort of think about the, yeah. the last hundred years of the modern corporation really invented in America and then spread all over the world, uh, we have a certain way of working, certain ways of business models and operating models. And our sense is that AI itself is now in this new shock that is changing how we think about operating models and business models. Mm -hmm. And the thing, you know, the thing that's so interesting is when people think about AI from executives down to the folks, uh, you know, on the front lines, they often think about uh, science fiction. They think about, yeah. uh, you know, the from Star Wars and Star Trek, right, to stuff you they see on Netflix, the stuff you yeah. see, you read in books. Yeah. All of that AI looks to be like sentient machines, autonomous, doing their own things. Right. Um, that's known as strong AI. And yeah. you know, different people have different views about when that's going to come 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 to fruition. But all the amazing things we are seeing today in companies is actually driven by what we call weak AI, which yeah. is you know narrow algorithms that do one thing and one thing really well. And yeah. those algorithms are what are changing the, the 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 landscape of business. So it's weak AI deployed at scale across the enterprise that are that from our perspective is what's 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 the game changer. Yeah. You know, I see that. I mean, I see that in my search experience on Google. I see it in my shopping experience on Amazon. Yeah. Um, I see it in a variety of different case studies we're going to talk about, like Ant Financial. You yeah. say that when a computer, along with a couple of computer scientists and some pretty weak AI, yes. can collaborate and then extend creative genius, it becomes one of those things that we know is gonna happen in a big way. I guess the question here is, are you saying, because of AI's incredible power, even weak AI, does yes. that mean it's going to be an eventuality for any organization that wants to remain competitive? Oh, 100%. I mean, look, I think, look, we're not gonna be living in a world of less data. We're not gonna be living in a world of less right. online. Right. We're not gonna be living in a less connectivity, less internet. All of these trends, and you know, post this crazy, COVID world we're living in have actually been accelerated even more so. Yeah. So, so, so in fact, our view is that already today, most of us as citizens using our smartphones are already using AI at scale from, yeah. you know, when you upload something to Facebook, to what you watch on Netflix, right, to your banking transactions, you know, you name it, AI is all around you, to your commands to Siri or Google Home. It's already here. And so, and at the moment, most of that has been deployed through these large companies, but that is changing rapidly. You know, they've made much of this, uh, of these algorithms freely available, it's all open source. And then the, the, the question is, how do the rest of us learn from this 
and in fact, change our organizations to make this happen. Because you know what's going on is mm. customer expectations about, yes. uh, about transaction ease, about service, about response times have changed radically. Yeah. You know, yeah. in the world, you know, a few months ago when I could order Uber, I was I, I caught myself one day saying, gosh, like I'm so impatient now that I want my Uber to magically show up in three minutes. Right. 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 <laughs> and a few years right. ago, it'd be like hours before I could get a taxi in Boston. Right. And now like That's three right. minutes. Right. And, and all of us have the same thing with all of these digital tools we have access to. But then in our business life, we're fine if, you know, if a student complaint takes two weeks to get resolved. Yeah. Like, hey, how is yeah. it that on the one hand, we are so much uh, uh, so demanding of our of our use cases uh, with our digital tools, but then in our own business lives, we're, we're not as demanding. I think that's going to shift. Tell us just a little bit about the research you did for the book. I think it's an amazing approach you took to really develop these insights. Yeah, so look, it's a, it's a dialogue that we have with practice. So, so we're lucky to be at Harvard Business School. Um, and when we teach at Harvard Business School, you know, 95% of what we teach is done through the case method, right? So what do cases imply? Cases imply us going into companies, getting permission mm -hmm. to spend time with them, and writing up about certain issues. So 2013, Marco and I started this case, uh, this course uh, in our elective curriculum called Digital Innovation and Transformation, right? Well mm -hmm. before digital transformation became a thing. Right. And what we were really interested in is like this emergence of uh, sort of this platform model uh, that was in Silicon Valley in the software sector, starting to creep into all other types of sectors, right? From uh, like what you guys are at Upwork, right? You're a platform right. that connects, you know, uh, uh, sort of freelance talent with demand in companies, right? right? That was at scale. That was not there before in the recruiting right. business in this way, right? You guys right. came up and did that, right? And so we got to see you know, in transportation, in hotels, in labor markets, you name it, this kind of a thing emerge. And so, of course, there's been a lot written about platform economics, and we started to sort of talk about that. But given the fact that we're in the operations and management department at, at Harvard Business School, we're like, yeah. but how are these companies working? What's going on? And so when we started to open up the hood and understood not just the platform strategy, but the platform operations, right. what we saw was, analytics, data, AI were becoming the center of the firm, right? right. The matching that, that Upwork provides, there's no person in there sort of matching right. people hand-to-hand -hand in the traditional recruiting business. It's software and algorithms, right? right? So the core value delivery is being moved over to software and algorithms and to data. Right. And that was like a big aha for us. And so right. then we started to do more cases on that side to say, hey, what, how is the operating model of the company changing? And then we actually went ahead and with our partners at Keystone Strategy started to actually survey a whole bunch of firms and say, yeah. hey, how is it that you guys are, are doing this? And this is actually correlated with impacts in terms of you know, profitability, in terms of growth, and so on and so forth. So it was both this sort of this deep dive into a whole bunch of companies, both success and failures, but also this large scale quantitative analysis to understand what, what are the drivers that, mm -hmm. that companies can do to make this, make this work for us. You were studying AI maturity. Uh, in a previous yeah. episode, we discussed the concept of digital maturity. Uh, I mentioned before, uh, Jerry Kane on Philips yeah. uh, technology fallacy. Talk to me a little bit about what AI maturity is. Yeah, I think, I, think, I think we're in a spectrum, right? So if you sort of mm. think about AI maturity, the way mm. you want to think about this actually is, it has to actually start with data, then digital and then AI, right? That's the that's the way forward. Okay, that's so the first path. is like, do you, that's the path. First is, do you even have data? A lot of mm. companies say, yeah, I have a lot of data, but really, do you really have data? Have you spent the time integrating right. all this data together? Is it siloed? Right. Is it dirty? All that kind of stuff, right? Right. The second is, you, your existing data. The second part of the digital side is, look, you need to be thinking about all the transactions that happen inside of your firm and mm -hmm. outside of your firm right, as potential new sources of data. And right. can we digitize those transactions? Okay. That's, the, that's the aha, right? What right. Nest did for the thermostat business was it digitized right, our energy consumption. It now had right. data on consumption, and then it could control it and, in fact, adjust for it and make a ton of money, both for, for energy agencies and themselves, in, in, in being able to, uh, to manage uh, peak demand, for example, right? 
So that's, that's if you're saying, oh, could I, if I'm in the thermostat business, can I start to digitize the data? Can I then use that to my advantage? And how yeah. does that help me change my business model and my operating model? So again, you have data, you have digitization, that gives you more data. And then AI comes in and says, okay, now that I have AI, weak AI, right? What can I now do with this, right? So what, what is AI good at? AI is good at prediction, right? right? coming up with predictions about some future state of the world. It's good at pattern recognition, recognizing right. patterns in data. And the third right. thing is, is process automation, right? So these three Ps of AI, right? Predictions, process automation, and pattern recognition is right. what is a maturity model. And the maturity Got model it. says- The three Ps, I love that. <laughs> the three Ps of AI, right? Predictions, uh, <laughs> predictions, pattern recognitions, process automation, right? Those three things, are in fact the guts of an organization. Yes. Right. If you think, yes. if you look inside of your firm, if you're a, if you're a leader in your firm, you can you should take an afternoon. Right. Go to the beach. Go to the mountains. Go go to the sidewalk. You know, get away from your office and sit down and say, what are all the predictions that we make in our organization? And you'll be yeah. surprised. Well, you make predictions about who to hire, right? right. Who to fire? Who to promote? what kind of teams to put together. Those are all prediction tasks, right? You make predictions about pricing, about inventory, customer churn, you name it. There's just a ton of predictions that go on, right? Right. And you go, oh, can I now, do I have data now to improve my prediction power, my wow. accuracy, right? My speed mm -hmm. of those predictions, right? Same thing around pattern recognition, all the things that happen in your company around pattern recognition, right? Trying to see, see in noise patterns that could be meaningful for you, right? Yeah. Again, you can make a ma massive list for that. Right. And then the last thing is you, you do this also for processes, right? What are the processes that I have set in play? And are there ways for me to both extract the data about these processes? And are there ways for me to automate these processes? That lens, and then thinking through saying, what is the footprint of my maturity? Yeah. Right, in being able to automate these things, drive more predictions through AI, drive more pattern recognition through AI, drive more automation through AI. That's what gets us to the maturity level. And the gotcha. best companies of the world, like the Ant Financials of the world and so forth, right? They have basically embedded AI throughout their entire operating model, right? And that's How the secret. Achieve, that's the secret. That's the secret. Yeah. It starts with data, starts with digitize, add digitization, but then you as an executive have to sort of say, right, how do I increase the footprint of the augmentation that AI provides to my organizations? And I think that's, I think, the, the, the core aspect of this. Part of this, part of this is, is actually uh, everybody is going to need an AI factory. Yeah. Okay. Everybody's yeah. in the AI factory, right? And the most important component of the AI factory is actually going to be your data pipeline. I see so many companies underinvest in their data pipeline, right? Mm. And this is like the grunt, non-sexy, non-terrible task, uh, the, the terrible secret of all yeah. these AI. Uh, Undifferentiated AI heavy lifting, right? Exactly. And then you go, yeah. what's the ROI on this data fact on this data pipeline? You don't have it, you're dead. You, yeah. you don't have it, it's garbage predictions, garbage pattern recognition, yeah. garbage process automation, wow. right? So you have to actually invest in this, in this thing. But the AI factory, right, is what's gonna actually drive your predictions, your pattern recognitions, and your process automation. And by the way, the AI factory in all companies is gonna look the same, right? The yeah. same processes are gonna be there, right? Data pipelines, right? Infrastructure development, algorithm development, experimentation, productization. And the more turns we have of this factory, right, the better off we're going to be. So for most companies, right, the thought process ha actually has to also include, I'm going to move to an industrial age of decision making, right? We're still in the craft model, right? How are decisions made today in organizations? Well, hey, Johnny, send me that spreadsheet, right? So, oh, wait, wait, I got I to gotta pull this data from five different databases. It's going to take me a while to write the SQL queries, right? Then the, then the database, then the, then the, then the, the, the dashboard shows up. Hmm, yeah. What should I do? Well, I'm going to ignore all this and do my own thing, right? This is, right. This is a craft-based way of how right. we make decisions. And what we're seeing is that it's the industrialization of decision-making that AI is actually driving mm. for us, right? Just and putting how a to real process these, these behind factories. it. Yeah, a scalable exactly. process exactly. behind it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And 
stopping for a second here, just define for our viewers what you mean by AI factory. Yeah, so AI factory for us is actually the core of what you're going to be building, right? At the moment, most companies are toying around with a pilot here, pilot there. It right. works, it doesn't work, and so on and so forth. Right. In order for us to compete in this age of AI, right, to compete in this age of AI, we will need to put the AI factory at the center of our organizations, right? Okay. Where analysis is not retrospective, right? Weeks old, days old, months old, right? Which is what most people do, right? And it's craft based. Right, so you have right. specialists sitting there writing, uh, writing, writing SQL queries, one-off one SQL queries, or putting putting together some dashboards and so forth. It has to be industrial, where mm. the flow of actions that happen inside of a company happen through the AI itself. Right, and we as managers, as workers, as developers, are making sure that this factory is working and it's performing in the right tolerances and so on and so right. forth. Right, but the work actually of the enterprise shifts to the machines. We become the designers and the governors of this machine, right? Got it. But the work is actually being done by the machine. Again, if you sort of think about it, right, you know, there's, you know, Mark Zuckerberg isn't moving photos around on Facebook, right? There's no right. army of people moving photos around, right? They right. write algorithms to move the photos around. Right. Right. And right. Uh, at Netflix, the 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 trailers you see aren't handmade. They're made by the machine. They figured out right. how to show you the rom com trailers for even a you know a a, a horror movie because they, they know you, I, I like rom com and then there's, there's going to be some rom com element in that horror movie. They're going to show me that trailer. Wow. To, get, you know, to to watch that. But that's all done by the machine. It's not yeah. done by by humans. And that's yeah. the AI factory making that possible. And the thing to note that makes total sense. Yeah, and the thing to note though, right, is that this AI factory, the the Facebook AI factory is the same as the Netflix AI factory. And by the way, the McDonald's AI factory will also look the same, have all these same components, right? And what's so interesting is that the hamburger factory for McDonald's looks very different from the AI factory, but the AI factory at McDonald's is going to look exactly like what everybody else has as well. And that's going to be part of the way we're going to be competing. So Getting back to the point you just made, though, about humans don't write the trailers that we see yes. AI does. Yes. One of the points you make in the book that really hits me is that AI is the core of the company and the entire critical path for the customer runs on AI and the humans yes. own the design for AI. Talk about that, the critical path. Yeah, yeah. So again, let's, 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 let me give another example, right? So I think, you know, one of my favorite companies, which is going to IPO soon, is Ant Financial out of China. These guys... Uh, the, I want some of that friends and family. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> uh, you know, these, these guys, these guys have, have really shown in a tough business, financial services, yeah. how to think about data, digitization, and AI. Yeah. Right? So the numbers are a bit staggering, and I think we're all going to learn about these numbers. Like, you know, right. 1.2 billion users. Wow. How quickly did they get to 1.2? How quickly did they do that? About a, about a decade. About a decade. That's amazing. About 10 years. Okay. About, a, about 10 years, right? Then it gets better. How many people do you think they have, right? They have about 10 to 12,000 people. Wow. 12,000 wow. people, 1.2 billion, right? The largest money market fund in, the, in, the, in China. Uh, maybe worldwide, the largest mm -hmm. uh, payments platform worldwide, right? You know, you name it, you name it, you name it, right? So I, I make this joke quite a bit. They have a bank, uh, bank system, uh, and they, the bank system says 310. That's their goal. And what is 310? Three <laughs> minutes to apply for a loan or an account, one second for app approval, zero human intervention. Wow, right. three one three, zero. One, zero. That's great. Right. That's crazy. My favorite metric, though, um, that I read in your book about Ant, is how much they slashed transaction costs. And I say this, Kareem, because yes. I've been involved a lot in blockchain for the last few years, and they talk about, hey, yes. you know, we reduce transaction costs 80, 90, 95 percent. Talk to us about how much they slashed transaction costs at Ant. Man, so so I, I you know, this, this is so amazing, right? So. If you do a payment transaction on, on Ant, the charge is 0.5% compared to Visa 
And 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 then and then when I talk to my my banking friends, I go, okay, if or you know, like if you have a million RMB in in their savings account, right? They they will offer you insurance of three RMB for a million a million dollars of savings. Wow, wow. Right, and it's just like it's just like in order for them to be able to do that, you just imagine the systems they've built to do all of this, right? Right. So this three one zero thing, right? I had, you know, I tried to open up a, uh, a bank account for my daughter at my neighborhood large U.S. bank recently, right? Mm-hmm. I've been banking with them for 20 years. Right. Three visits to the branch, beautiful branch, marble everywhere. They offered me coffee yep. and all that kind of stuff, yep. right? And 45 minutes at a time trying to f- open up her account. And then the, the two things happened, which is like, oh, you, you, we don't have your signature, I'm like, you don't have my signature. How long have I been banking with you guys for? Like, you know, 20 years. Oh, but the branch moved, so we lost your signature card, so you need to... I'm like, why do you need a signature card still? Like, what, why, why is this a thing in your banks when you have... You, you see me on my app, you have my driver's license, you have my social security. Like, why? Right? I'm sure there's some obscure trend regulation for that. Fine. Right. So uh, right. you 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 guys screwed up, and now you're blaming me that you don't, I don't you don't have my signature, yeah. right? Okay, so that's, that's a great classic. customer service. Yeah. And then okay, so we set up the bank account for my for my daughter, and then I go okay, great. So she's going to be going on a school trip. I'm going to get her a credit card. The branch guys goes well. You got to call the 800 number because we don't do credit cards here. <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you are you kidding me? And that's what that that was the response. Yeah, call the 800 number and you know stay in the queue and you know. And I was like, wow, 310, 310 in and financial. And then I don't know what. And so my joke is I'm sure this bank would need, you know, 100 million workers to serve 1.2 billion right. you know, right. users. And, and yeah. And, and I think you're right. And, you know, let's talk a little bit about the why behind Ant Financial's miraculous accomplishments. We, we are all aware from the Instagram story about what it means to be mobile first as an yes. app or as a company. Yes. But I think with Ant, what we're talking about is digital first, right? So it's not a yes. new business model, it's a new no. operator. No, look, they, they copied PayPal, right? They said, okay, like, okay, we, we, need, right? we need a payment system. PayPal yeah. can, comes around, they, they see that. And they go, we need escrow. We got escrow, right? But what they soon realized, right? This was their big aha, is that, okay, I can enable transactions, right? Between merchants and, and consumers. Merchants of all types, consumers of all types. Right. I'm sitting off Alibaba's transaction business, right? And I've got escrow. I'm making a little cut from the transactions going through. Then they go, oh, but what do these transactions mean? Oh, I now have data on consumer buying habits and merchant liquidity. Right. Oh, well, maybe I can offer them a way to hold more money, right? So now I have a new service. I expand my scope. Oh, I see the ratings of these merchants, right? So I can now assess credit worthiness of the merchants. Right. Or maybe I can now start to offer them loans. Yes. Oh, right. And so on and so on. So the data, right, they, they, they enable the transactions, but most companies stand at the transaction level. They don't say, what are the transactions? What's the meta level analysis we could do right. from the data about the transactions, which right. allow me to generate the next set of services for both the consumers and the merchants. And it's this flywheel of, you know, as I get usage, I get data. As I get right. data, more data, I get better algorithms. As I get better algorithms, I can create better services. That drives more usage. That flywheel is embedded with an ant. That's right. how they think all the time. Exactly. And it really brings me to what I believe is the kernel. That's what I call it when I read a book. There's a kernel to a book, a central insight, the one that causes me to say, oh, wow, I've got to tell my friends about it. I read this Harvard Business Review excerpt from your book last year, and you said it's not just about a new technology to master. It's about an entirely new company. Talk to me about that. Yeah. Yeah. So look, I think, I think the, the, you know, we talk a bit about Conway's law, mm-hmm. right? Uh, which is about how technology mirrors the organization uh, that you have set, set yourself up with. Right. And our view is that the architecture of an AI first company technology stack 
actually is also going to show you the architecture of the organization. Mm -hmm. And most of the misses in digital transformation and now this AI-driven transformation happen because there's a mismatch between what the technology needs in terms of the architecture, right, the technical yeah. architecture, and the yeah. organization's ability to provide that, right? If you are if you are a siloed organization and now all of a sudden you're, you're thinking, okay, I'm going to provide end-to-end -end customer service for all my customers, right? But the the silos have owned the data. Right, have no right. no reasons to share the data. You're never going to be able to do what an Ant Financial does. Right. This is right. my example. Like you know, branch versus credit card. Two different silos. Two different data sets. Two different ways. Right. Yeah. They've got some glue that fits it together, but really, it's pretty terrible. Right. Yeah. And so this 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 organizational transformation agenda from my point of view, is as important as a technological agenda. In fact, what I often say is that, look, the playbook for this is transparent. Right. There's no Everybody's going to have the same IR factory at the end of the day. Exactly. It's transparent. Exactly. The, the, and, and by the way, our friends at Google and Amazon and Facebook and Alibaba and Baidu are showing us how to do it. They're open books. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right? On how to right. do this. They publish open papers source. on this. Yeah. Open source everything. Right? Yeah. Um, lots of talent has come out of them setting up new companies. The, the, it's, it's, it's not, there's no secrets about what they do. It's all about the courage to set up new organizational forms to pull this off. And so this new type of organization that we see, right, yeah. is rethinking, right, how you achieve scale, right, how you serve lots of customers, right. how you achieve scope, how you offer them many things, and then yes. how you learn and how you improve. And that's fundamentally yes. very different than what we've been doing before in our, in our businesses. Important hierarchy there. Um, that really is important for everybody to think about. Scale, scope, and learning, it's not new. <laughs> In fact, no, traditional companies have been failing because they achieved too much scale, they attempted too much scope, and they were encumbered by too much demand to learn. So what yeah. you're saying in the book then is that digital technology becomes the new choke point instead of labor. Yes. How does that change the game, Kareem? I mean, it's a radical shift, right? I mean, again, if you sort of think about the metrics in the financial financial markets about value, right? Right. You look at how hard Ford is working, how hard Goldman Sachs works, right? And you think about a metric that we sort of have played with, which is like value per employee, you know, uh, generated, right? And there's orders of magnitude more in these AI first companies. Right, because they can just scale in a very different way. And right. by the way, they scale in a very different way, but also they don't suffer from quality issues. Right. <laughs> right. They create a high quality product. You know, one of my right. favorite companies, one of my obsessions these days is Peloton. Right. Oh, and yeah. I look at Peloton, and these guys are killing it, right, in the sense of they've really figured out how to do fitness instruction at scale. Right. So they have now, the last time I chatted with them, about 2.6 million members. Right. Only 36 instructors, right? And my daily Peloton sessions, I have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the instructors who I've never met. I'm their fanboys if they show up yeah. to town. I'm there yeah. for them. Right? <laughs> but they have, they have learned how to do fitness instruction at scale. And they've blown right. past the boutique models of SoulCycle and Flywheel and so forth, right? And I look at them, I go, gosh, we have something to learn from them here at Harvard Business School, right? Because right. we also, in our beautiful classrooms, run basically soul cycle studios, right? right? But how do we learn to scale? And how do yeah. we break the compromise that we often say that as you scale, you lose quality, you use luster? Right. And that's exactly, yeah, that's exactly how I think about scale. I think of it as pixelation in the world of photography, right? You blow the photo yeah. up too much, it becomes yeah. blurry at some point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you talk about scale too, you make a good point that in digital world, when you scale, you have almost zero variable cost, whereas in yes. traditional world, scale creates diminishing returns. Is that the same for scope as well as learning? Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. I mean, I think I think I think the demand in the traditional world, the demands of scale, scope, and learning basically lead to organizational inertia, administrative yeah. bureaucracies, yeah. right? And, and also, like, you know, look, it worked. It worked for the hundred past hundred years. We could be a multi-division company. We could right. be siloed. We could be effective. And each silo, each person would go get their thing, 
you know, eat what you kill kind of a mentality right. in organizations. Right. That's, that's, that was effective. But today, it's no longer going to be effective, right? Today, yeah. right? I mean, I have inertia with my U.S. banks. I don't have good outside options with my U.S. banks to right. change. But as right. soon as that becomes available, I'm moving. That makes total sense. That's why Ant has disrupted the banking yeah. systems, the financial tech systems in yes. China is because the vulnerability has always been there. Um, I always yeah. call it the common consumer complaint. Like when you study the blockbuster entertainment story, right? Yes. There had been a yes. longstanding customer complaint in several categories. Uh, I hate late yes. fees, I hate long yes. lines, and I hate bad inventory. Yes. And it was yes. a vulnerability that Netflix was able to come along and exploit. But one of the things you said also intrigues me just earlier, you talked a little bit about data. It can't be in silos. You write in the book that when data becomes central, so it becomes yes. something that's not in just one container, but it's available across the enterprise yes. and all data of the enterprise is in this repository, you yes. say that experimentation can be decentralized. Does that mean that yes. we get more swings at the plate when we centralize exactly. our data? hundred percent, a hundred percent. And actually, I want to tie your, 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 your blockbuster comment to this as well, right? Good. So just cool. imagine, right? As we talked about blockbuster, right? They had late fees, they had popcorn, they had location and all that kind of stuff, right? So I imagine there was a late fee optimization department, right? Yeah. <laughs> at Netflix. I'm sure there was also, uh, at, at blockbuster, right? I'm sure there's also like the, like the rewind fee department. Remember right. rewind fees with the old. Oh <laughs> the man, <VHS> I remember <laughs> those. <laughs> right, and, oh. and and so and so so when what did Netflix do in the DVD side of the things? Right, they come along and say all these things that you have optimized around late fees and popcorn, right, and geographic locations, all your core strengths. We're going to turn them into core weaknesses. Yeah. Right, and you can yeah. imagine the conversation when and this has happened. Right, Netflix goes to Blockbuster and says, hey, buy us. And Blockbuster says, no way, right? Because the late fee head was saying, what? There's no late fees. There's no, there's no 100% pure margin business in this right. thing. We're, we're going to mail stuff. We don't know how to mail stuff, right? We know how to block ship to a, to a corner store. We can't do individual mailing. Right. So you see how the, the architecture of the technology matches yes. the architecture of the, uh, I do. Of, the, of, the, of the organization. And so, yeah. and, and so the same thing, on data. So what does Netflix get? Netflix was able to then, at the very individual level, know what you liked, what you didn't right. like, right? They right. got the ratings data. Blockbuster never got the ratings data, right? right. Netflix got this rating data. And then th mm. this then becomes a large scale experimentation platform right. because now I can try different things. I can, I can basically say, well, maybe I need to show you some other movies and maybe that's going to make you stay longer with us, right? Maybe I need to change the format. Maybe I change the, the, the sort order by which these movies are shown to you. Maybe I show you more reviews, less reviews. Yeah. And, and so this factory allows you to make a lot of bets. So talk to me about Amazon, for example. They have a large scale experimentation capability. How many experiments do they conduct, uh, say, daily, annually? I think, I think, I think, I don't have the exact numbers for Amazon, but it's in the thousands, right? Wow. It's in the thousands. Uh, wow. A good, good example, actually, is Booking.com, you know, in the travel mm -hmm. site. Mm -hmm. They, they are, in fact, amazingly radical. What they say is anybody in the organization can run an experiment on the live site, wow. <laughs> right? I mean, That's just think crazy. about the culture you need and the system you need that enables a copywriter in the looking after you know uh, uh, the the sub segment of the Swiss chalets who's going to run an experiment. But they have that ability, right? So think about the organization, think about the technology, and that's what drives everything is a, is a scientific hypothesis and it's either verified or it's not verified. And what, you know what the good news is? If it's not verified, we don't need to implement it. Let's put it away. Let's move on. And what happens in most organizations is that we don't ever verify. We just try and then we move on. Right? And we, and take we, the, we take the hit. We take the operating hit, right? Exactly. Um, th this is why I bet, um, I don't know if this is the case, but it seems to me, Ant Financial is a great name for a company because an ant can lift multiples its weight, right? Yes. So it's an unusually exactly. powerful exactly. for its size yeah. Creature. Let's talk a little bit, though, um, as we wrap here about traditional companies. So, so far, we've talked about digital first, but there's yes. been organizations that have had really big 
as you would say, operating transformations. The first one I'm going to talk about is Walmart. Walmart's always been great at IT, but they were still flat-footed when Amazon came along. However, and I've been working with Amazon since the turn of the century, uh, they did get involved in e-commerce early. Is Walmart successfully adopting the models you write about so they can better compete with the Amazons? Yeah, I I think think Walmart, I think think the, the big aha for Walmart is you know, we're a data, they were always an IT company and yeah. a logistics company. And yeah. now they're like waking up to saying, can I be a data company? Right. Can I be a data company where I actually have a really good sense of my end consumers in ways that was not possible before? And can I tra- fundamentally transform? How do I not have these large superstores become, uh, you know, yeah. a boat anchor, but in fact become a strength? Oh, that's right? a great and example. I think, right. And I think, and I yeah. think, and I think, I think we're going to see, we're seeing this transformation happen at Walmart. Yeah. Uh, another good example, I think, is Disney. I mean, you look at Disney Plus, right? Yeah. That has saved them right now. And it went through a process to say, we're going to cut across all these silos we have in Disney of all the different, you know, uh, properties and IP we have. And we're going to put it all together and they're one thing. Response to, in fact, right, Netflix. Well, they mm-hmm. saw what, what Netflix was doing, and they go, "We have, we actually are the content creators. Let's actually build Disney Plus." And yeah. Disney Plus for me is a great example of a of a, a, you know an old dog learning new tricks and doing exactly. transformation. The last example I want to plumb with you just for a second is Microsoft. Yeah. Um, Satya yes. Nadella says that AI is the new runtime. Talk about yeah. the incredible reverse reversal of fortune we've seen at Microsoft over the last few years. Yeah, I mean, I think I, to be quite honest, I had written them off, you know, as, as Satya came over. I'm like, oh, these guys are done. They're 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 all about yeah. shipping boxes, shipping yep. CDs, you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah, I think this guy and this company is 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 going to be viewed as one of the most transformative leaders in American business. Right? I think so. Taking taking a product business, moving it to a service business, transforming the culture of the organization, transforming the business model of the organization, right? Competing with Amazon, right, uh, on the cloud side, competing with, with Google on the cloud side, knowing when to give up on things, right? I think, I think the, the, and you know, we've done, spent some time with them, the internal transformation of their IT groups, of their finance right. groups, of their operations group, right, of them all becoming data driven platforms internally is yeah. quite incredible. And that's, that, you know, this is top down. This is Satya saying, this is what we need to become. Right, and we're going to change both our technology, but also our organization, right? And I think that that's a great example um, that I think lots of people will be studying in yeah. the future and being inspired by it. And they have many visionaries. Kurt, their EVP over core services, talks about yes. our process is the product. I mean, I just have to have you just comment on that. I think that's so insightful. Yeah, look, I think I think I think I think I think Kurt Bodine, you know, really sort of sort of says. And this is the view, like like we say, everything that we do generates data. Mm-hmm. Let's take that data and learn and measure and figure out if we're yeah. any good at these things. Yeah. And if we're not, let's improve, right? And if we're better, let's get even more better, right? Yeah. But that mentality to say, let's actually be voracious interpreters of what we're doing yes. by being data first, AI first along the way. Right. I think that's that's such a great mindset change. Yeah, right? and that's uh, that's a huge to. shift. And that's an insight I want to really bring home here uh, as we finish. Uh, so many organizations have an architectural inertia, as you call it, yes. just like Blockbuster yeah. did. Yes. A, a leader watching this that's really feeling the itch, knowing, wow, yeah. we've got to do a yes. lot of work. How do you get started overcoming that architectural yeah. inertia? Just like maybe Walmart, uh, you mentioned Abby, uh, a lot of Pitney yeah. Bowes, they've all done it. Yes. How do you do it, Kareem? Yeah, yeah. So what I want to say first, though, is that the following. People often ask me, you know, are machines going to replace humans? Yeah. Right. And um, uh, I heard this from Peter Domingos, who is uh, a faculty member at the University of Washington. And Mm -hmm. I love what he said, which is like, look, machines aren't going to replace humans, but humans with machines are going to replace humans without machines. Yeah, I love that. That's great. Right. So that is the the mentality you need to have as a CEO. You need to come in and say, okay, this is a new superpower that is widely available. It's not so difficult for me to get. Where do I begin? Well, I often say, start at the customer value side. 
Right. Think about the, these things we talked about, predictions, the three Ps, predictions, pattern recognitions, process automation. Make a list, figure out which of those, if you improve those, would increase customer value. Figure out the customer value first. Then start your project. Do you have enough data to, to impact this, these metrics? If you do, go. If you don't, how do you get the data, right? And then how do you build a model that helps you improve the accuracy of those predictions, for example, right? But don't get stuck in like the anti-gravity world of machine learning and, right. and data science, right? Which is like, right. oh, we need nine months to actually even clean the data. Then we'll exactly. try it out. And, you know, it's going to be a research project. Uh, come back to us in a year. You as a leader have to say, show me a working prototype in three months. Right. Show me a working right. prototype in three months around a particular pilot. But if you're going to do a pilot, you as a leader are going to say two things. I'm going to implement and I'm going to scale. Right. Implement and scale. Yeah. Right. So pilot, implement, scale needs to be thought of up front. And you implement and scale with the notion that I can then build the capability in my organization to increase the footprint. Yeah. Right. Often what happens, Tim, is that people look at these giants and go, wow, getting there is going to be impossible. So I'm not even going to try. Right. But these, these giants weren't this, this giant a decade ago. And financial right. was just a little payments processor for Alibaba. Right. 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 But it was basically one step at a time yeah. expanding the scope of what they were doing with AI. And I think this, that's the same view. You have yeah. to start now. You have to start today. But you can go, you can do it. And the playbook, you know, is clear. Playbook is transparent. It's right there. So for the viewers, what great takeaways. And I would kind of do kind of a descending legato on these takeaways here. The first one is stop obsessing about business models. The game is about operating models, right? The second yes. idea yes. is stop looking at AI as a threat. Instead, you should yeah. see it as an emerging superpower that if nothing else, protects your team members you care so much about. And to Kareem's last point, take this step. Create a yeah. very short timeline to create a prototype. But I think the most important thing I read from the book from you is AI is not a skunk works project. It's not something you just try in a department, right, Kareem? The CEO no, exactly. needs to own this. It needs to be at the core. Um, these are all such tremendous insights. Um, you've got to go buy a copy of Competing in the Age of AI. You got to read it. Um, and I think you'll learn a lot from it. Um, Kareem, I just want to thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, your, yeah. your generosity of insights. And I just want to really compliment you and Marcos on the research and how you turned it into such game changing prose. Thank you so thank much you for so being much. on the show. No, thank I you. really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much.